I will get started here with our agenda. We've got lots of partner agencies joining us, the Sustainability and Mobility Department today. Um, a couple of those are, um, we've got Julia with Climate Resilient SD. Um, we are gonna be having our folks from Ur Urban Forestry and Tree Canopy speak on their work, uh, Parks and Recreation as well. And then we also have Stormwater joining us for this second resilience workshop. We'll also share um, how to get involved and how you can commit to climate action. Um, we'll go over some volunteer opportunities and upcoming events. And then um, if you stick around toward the end of the presentation, we will also do some interactive uh, questions and answers. We want to hear from you all on um, how you navigate the city and how you contribute to climate action. So I'm going to quickly start with uh, the climate emergency. And I want to take the like scariness and negative out of that because this isn't to scare you, this is to educate you. Um, we know that uh, extreme weather events are happening more and more. Things like floods, things like droughts, um, fires, um, colder weather, uh, and so we know that our global levels are warming, and so one of the things that I want to speak to is the climate action plan, uh, which is the city's action plan to reduce those global warming letter, uh, levels by reduction of what we call greenhouse gas emissions. And this is really to work to improve the quality of life for all San Diegans in the city. The graph here that you see on the presentation uh, is representing our six strategies that are in the Climate Action Plan. We'll go into a little bit more detail on those in the next slide. Um, but even if uh, we were to hit all five of those first strategies, so taking away the light green color to get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions, by 2030, we're still not at net zero with those five strategies. So I'll speak a little bit on that light green color, which is strategy six that we call emerging climate actions. And that's to leave space for us to think about what more can we do? How can we be more innovative with our ideas and our actions and how we are addressing climate change? So I'll quickly walk us through the uh, six different strategies here. Um, again, today we're focused on strategy number five, resilient infrastructure and healthy ecosystems. So think about our natural environment, our waterways, our green infrastructure, our trees, our parks, um, the places that you like to visit. Uh, and then strategy one and two are mainly around decarbonization and clean and renewable energy or electrification. So think about electric vehicles, think about electrifying buildings and homes by changing out natural gas and um, using some sort of a clean energy as an option. Uh, mobility and land use is a big strategy as well. Think about all the ways that you get around the city, whether that's walking, on a scooter, on a bicycle, on, on the trolley, um, and then of course in our vehicles, which cause the most amount of greenhouse gas emissions and why we want people to use their vehicles less. Um, circular economy and clean communities, which is strategy four. Um, think about as an example, I don't know if you all have received yet the green bin rollout. So our um, environmental services department is giving away or giving out to residents the organic green bin waste rollout. Uh, and so if you haven't received that, you should be getting one. But that's just one example of how we are going to address circular economy and clean communities. Another big one, a uh, uh, big item under that strategy is food access, food connectivity, food waste, food distribution. Um, we hear a, a lot that that's a priority from our communities. Um, and then again, as I mentioned in that first slide, strategy six is for emerging climate actions or what other ways should we be thinking about contributing and um, fighting climate change because we're not going to do it with just these five strategies. We have to build space to think about more innovative ways as well. I'll speak a little bit on climate equity. What is climate equity? So climate equity is um, an, the intersection of environmental justice and social equity. Um, it's addressing historical inequities uh, suffered by our communities of concern is how we refer to those in San Diego. 
Um, in other words, we also uh, have heard or referenced um, disadvantaged communities, disinvested, vulnerable communities. So the areas that we know are experiencing higher levels of negative climate impacts is the prioritization through climate equity. Um, and it allows us to fairly share both the benefits and the burdens of climate solutions. Um, and this is really to attain full and equal access to opportunities regardless of one's background and identity. Identity. The map here that you see on the screen and the legend represent the entire city of San Diego. And so um, looking at those different colors, our communities of concern are represented in the three that are boxed in the red uh, square there. So very low, low and moderate. Um, and you can see here through the colors um, which areas of the city that we are really zooming in and focusing on to prioritize around climate equity. How does the city address climate equity? So I want to share a little bit about all the different ways that the city is addressing climate equity. One of them I just spoke to is the Climate Equity Index, which is the map that we just saw. Uh, the Climate Equity Index was created in 2019 and updated in 2021 by the City of San Diego's uh, Climate Action Team in partnership with uh, many different community-based organizations that uh, serve communities of concern as well as the uh, San Diego region uh, to really help address those um, uh, inequities that we know have been historically experienced. Um, the Climate Equity Working Group uh, is a monthly group. It's an informal working group that meets every third Wednesday of the month at 10.30 a.m. And really that is a group of about 30 to 40 community-based organizations that come together to um, connect, to break barriers, to share information around events, volunteer opportunities, grant opportunities, where we can find funding to really um, help those uh, community-based organizations thrive. Um, the city also uses the Climate Equity Working Group as a sounding board or to reflect on the work that we're doing and um, see how we're doing, right? Whether it, we're doing a good job or if we need some improvements. Um, so that's a really great working group that we do actively host um, every month. Community engagement, I want to emphasize equitable community engagement is a very big priority of the city of San Diego. This um, meeting today or this workshop around resilience and climate action is just one of those ways that we're trying to be more equitable um, in our engagement in communities of concern primarily, but throughout the entire city as well. And then lastly, I'll just touch very quickly on the Climate Equity Fund, which is one of my favorite things. It's a bucket of money uh, that the city has set aside that we are distributing and allocating to projects that are specifically within communities of concern, specifically within our zero to 60 threshold of the Climate Equity Index. And that index go, does go all the way to 100. Um, so uh, this year for fiscal year 24, we actually got up to just over $11 million that we are able to allocate into projects and funding. Um, and that process is right now going through different leaderships and departments and making its way over to the Department of Finance so that it can be considered for the budget prioritization for 2024. And so uh, with that, I'm going to pass it to our uh, Julia Chase with Climate Resilient SD. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Julia Chase. I am the Chief Resilience Officer with the City of San Diego and I will be talking to you about Climate Resilient SD. Um, but before we dive into that, I wanted to kind of talk about the distinction between what is resilience and what is mitigation, which both of those words might be a little bit unfamiliar to you. Mitigation is what Val was just talking about with our climate action plan. So that's looking at how are we reducing greenhouse gas emissions, whether that's through clean energy or the way that we move around, um, you know, looking towards more public transit and clean transportation options. Those are all reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Resilience, on the other hand, says, we know that climate change is, is a global issue and that globally we haven't um, met the emissions reductions that we need to. So we're going to be seeing impacts from climate change. And so we need to make sure that our communities and our infrastructure is prepared for these impacts, is able to respond and able to recover from the climate change um, events that we're going to see. And then that box in the middle there is showing that there's also a synergy. There's a space of overlap between the two of these 
The example I always give is trees, and Brian will talk much more about trees later. Um, but they're a wonderful example of they have that mitigation component. They're pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, so helping us to meet those climate action plan goals. But they're also providing us additional benefits when it comes to things like flooding, where they can help to absorb some of that flood water and, and reduce the amount that we're seeing um, flooding. So to talk a little bit more about, there we go, Climate Resilient SD, it's uh, the city's first comprehensive climate adaptation and resilience plan, really looking at how are we preparing for, responding to, and recovering from climate change events. Um, it was adopted in December of 2021, so we're now in the implementation phase of the plan um, with a commitment to update the plan every five years so that the plan is really relevant. It's taking into account um, current city needs um, and the best available science. The plan addresses uh, our four primary climate change hazards. The first is extreme heat. So we know that we're going to see more frequent heat waves that last for longer and are hotter. Um, it addresses wildfires, so uh, more frequent wildfires that burn for longer, um, coastal flooding and coastal erosion due to sea level rise, as well as flooding. So we know that we're going to see um, an increase in the amount of precipitation um, events that we're seeing, but with that um, stronger fluxes of precipitation, so more rain in shorter periods of time. If you think to earlier this year, some of the rain events that we got, where we got a tremendous amount of precipitation in a short period of time, that is going to become more frequent, and then also anticipating that we'll have periods of drought in between these, these rain um, events. So to start the planning effort, what we wanted to do was really understand where are we going to see these hazards across the city? Where should we be looking at and focusing our efforts? So we mapped out those four hazards across the city. Up here on the left, you'll see sea level rise. In the middle is our brush management zones and areas. And then on the far right is um, our urban heat island. And so what climate hazard mapping really did for us was it allowed us to focus in on what areas of the city should we be most concerned about for each of the hazards and where do we not need to be concerned? From there, so we took that first layer was the exposure of where to be concerned to really understand the vulnerability of our communities and of our assets and our infrastructure. We also need to look at how sensitive was the asset to that climate change hazard. So, you know, if it's a, a concrete structure, it might not be that sensitive to flooding. Whereas if it has a lot of electrical equipment, it might be really sensitive to flooding. And then what is the adaptive capacity of that asset or of that community? Is it um, a mobile station that can easily be moved out of harm's way or is it you know, set in place and it doesn't really have adaptive capacity? So we did that across a, all of our assets and all of our resources in a very long document um, to understand what were the highest vulnerabilities. So again, really looking at where are we going to be focusing our efforts? What should we be most concerned about? Where do we want to be investing in our planning efforts and our infrastructure? All of that culminated with um, visioning for goals for Climate Resilient SD. So we have five goals for the plan. The first is connected and informed communities. This is really looking at are we making sure that our communities have the information that they need um, to be prepared for these climate change events? It also looks at are we collaborating regionally with other jurisdictions, regional organizations, community-based organizations, universities, really sharing that knowledge across the San Diego region. Our second goal is a resilient and equitable city. Val spoke some about this, but this is really looking at how are we centering and prioritizing equity in the plan and in the plan implementation. So understanding that some areas of our city are going to the impacts of climate change first and worst with the fewest resources to respond. So we want to make sure that we are focusing both implementation of strategies and investment in those areas. The third strategy is protect historic and tribal cultural resources. This uh, goal really focuses on um, and recognizes that a lot of these resources are very sensitive to climate change impacts. And so we want to make sure that we are both acknowledging the cultural significance of these resources and that we're protecting them going into the future. Our fourth goal is thriving natural environments. This is recognizing the tremendous value that our, our green spaces, our open spaces, our parks provide to our community and our community members, um, you know, areas for recreation, but also that critical habitat that we want to make sure that we are protecting. And then the fifth goal is maintain critical city services. So this is things um, you know, like, like our fire department, our lifeguards, um, provision of water and wastewater services, all of those critical services that the city provides that we want to make sure those are not interrupted when we have any of these climate change events. 
So underneath all of those five goals, we have 88 adaptation resilience strategies. I will not run through all of them, um, but they really focus on both how are we reducing that risk to the climate change hazard, so how are we reducing risk to flooding or to wildfire, but also how are we building community capacity to respond. So we don't want to just be reducing that risk, we want to be building stronger communities that are able to thrive in a changing climate. Um, and I just want to touch on a couple of the priorities of the plan. So the first is equity-centered implementation. In plan development, we really um, focused on making sure that we were engaging with our communities of concern, that we were holding outreach events in those communities and hearing those voices because we know that those communities are some that are going to be experiencing and already experiencing the impacts of climate change. Um, within the plan itself, we also have strategies specific to equity that look at investing in those communities and prioritizing equity and the needs of those communities. And as we are now in implementation, we're looking at how are we prioritizing strategies that provide um, social equity benefits and how are we making sure that we are continuing to implement those strategies where the need is the greatest. Another prioritization of Climate Resilient SD are nature-based solutions. Um, so up here is a kind of a spectrum of solutions. Um, gray on the far right is that typical infrastructure solution, very highly engineered, a concrete seawall that you might be familiar with. As you move to the green portion of, of the spectrum, these are still maybe engineered solutions, but they're modeled after nature. So you might have something like a bioswale or a green street that has additional green space to absorb that water. It's engineered, but it's using, um, using what we've learned in the knowledge of nature. And then on the far left, we have natural solutions. So this is looking at habitat creation or habitat restoration um, to really protect those, those critical habitats, but also recognizing that these habitats provide a lot of benefits. So they are going to absorb stormwater. They're going to provide water quality benefits. They'll provide cleaner air. They might um, reduce wave runoff if they're, they're coastal. And so within Climate Resilient SD, we really recognize that nature-based solutions don't just provide that risk mitigation, they provide all of these other benefits to our communities. And so we want to make sure that we're prioritizing them in implementation. We also heard overwhelming support from community members for nature-based solutions um, in our public outreach during plan development. So that's another reason why they're prioritized in the plan. Um, to, to close, I want to highlight a couple of the kind of first implementation actions um, of the plan that um, are, are close to, to my heart and I think are really exciting. The first is an extreme heat mapping uh, community event that we held. Um, we focused on our communities of concern, so that purple hatch up there are our communities of concern, and then we worked with local community members um, as well as students to um, attach sensors, that middle picture shows you the sensor, it attaches onto your car, and they drove different routes around the community morning, afternoon, and evening during a heat event um, over the summer. And what that showed us was what areas of the city were both experiencing heat the most, but also where were they retaining heat. So that last image there is showing you that dark red, those are images in the evening that they're retaining heat at night, they're not cooling down. And that gives us a really good sense of where is there maybe more risk during a heat event? Because if it's not cooling down in your neighborhood at night, that's where we start to have public health concerns because your body also then can't cool down the temperature. So it was a really great way to involve youth, involve community members, share with them about um, extreme heat, but also do some incredible citizen community, community science. The next is a, an urban heat vulnerability index. This was a really cool project that we were able to do with grant funding um, through the Thriving Earth Exchange and NASA Develop. And with this, we looked at heat exposure, so land use, how much um, impermeable surface you had um, it, by census tract across the city, as well as vulnerability, looking at social vulnerability factors like age or pre-existing health conditions that might make um, a certain community or a certain population more vulnerable to heat events. And that really helped us to understand where is their greatest risk to extreme heat across the city. Um, so both of these, um, the community heat mapping and the urban heat vulnerability index will really serve to inform implementation of our heat strategies moving forward. And then finally, we have our, our Coastal Resilience Master Plan. This is now underway. Um, it's looking along our coastline for six locations that are vulnerable to sea level rise um, and designing nature-based solutions for them that will both 
reduce the risk to sea level rise, that will improve coastal access, and that will provide habitat benefits um, for some of our protected species. Uh, so this is a really exciting planning effort. We're, we're thinking outreach will be um, next winter, but we'll be sharing more information as this planning effort goes forward, um, looking to do some community workshops and some really fun pop-up engagement events. So definitely stay tuned um, and keep an eye out for those. And then finally, as we look forward, um, we are really excited to continue to engage with our community members throughout plan implementation to prioritize equity and nature-based solutions, to use the best available science, um, and to take advantage of a lot of the funding opportunities that we're seeing both at the state and the federal level to help support our work. And with that, I will pass it off to Brian. I'm uh, Brian Whitener. City of San Diego City Forester under Transportation Department, um, but I manage the city's urban forestry program, which includes trees in our city public spaces, including parks, uh, street trees in the right of way, uh, and other public spots as well. So I'm going to talk about urban forestry and tree canopy cover. Under the uh, Climate Action Plan Measure uh, 5.2, uh, the city wants to increase its tree canopy cover. Why is tree canopy cover important? It's because it determines the health of our urban forest. It's a metric that a lot of other municipalities throughout the United States use to determine if our forest is healthy, if it's vast, if it's green, um, and we uh, use remote sensing, which um, we fly over the forest, um, collect data that way through lasers, as well as look at um, orthographic um, photos and aerial imagery to come up with um, the value for our uh, canopy cover. Excuse me. Uh, and in 2015, it was 13%. Really like this photo, too, as well. Um, this is up in uh, Rancho Penasquitos, but some Tipuana trees along the street that are really creating that nice canopy cover um, in the community. Canopy cover includes all vegetation taller than eight feet. So this is the data from 2014, uh, which was analyzed in 2015. And it's really neat. We've got some, some neat tools actually on our webpage, www.sandiego.gov slash trees, where you can look at what the canopy cover looked like in 2014, and even zoom in to your community or your neighborhood to see what that looked like. And then the map on the right shows you all the um, community communities throughout the city of San Diego. Uh, the darker greens are where the canopy cover is a little bit greater, um, anywhere from 20 to 28%. Uh, and then the, the lighter areas, uh, at least according to this map, have less than 7% canopy cover. So there's kind of a lot of different types of canopy uh, percentages throughout the city, depending on what the land use is, um, the density of the community, and a lot of other factors. This is a slide for LIDAR, light detection and ranging. Um, you can Google this. Um, it's not that complicated, but it's, um, like I said, a technology that a lot of municipalities are um, using throughout the country to see what their urban forest looks like. LIDAR can be used for a lot of things, too, um, looking at other vegetation types. Um, it can pick up building footprints. Um, even sidewalks, it's, uh, it's very fascinating technology. So we have somewhere in the ballpark, probably more than 230,000 plus street trees. We're actually conducting a street tree inventory right now. So um, I think we're actually probably closer to the 250,000 mark um, based on recent data that we've received. This equals about $21 million in yearly ecosystem benefits, which includes carbon storage, stormwater capture, and really more importantly, trees make our communities more walkable, more livable. People want to have trees in their neighborhood or in their shopping districts. Great thing about trees is they provide shade, right? 
And this is also a, another great photo. I know it's a little washed out here. Um, this was taken over in um, Nestor, not too far away from here. We recently planted, a couple years ago, um, 300 new street trees. Um, in this particular block, we've got some large ash trees that are creating that really nice canopy cover. And, um, but this is just one of only a few um, blocks in that community that have a really nice um, tree resource. So um, again, we went in there and planted about 300 new trees. <clears throat> we think we have about 600,000 uh, park trees, but we don't know that for sure. It's pretty tough to, to um, take a tree count in um, many of our park locations, especially open spaces where um, it's just almost impossible in some cases to get boots on the ground to um, figure out where all the trees are. But we can get at least an estimate through LIDAR and some other remote sensing. Um, so that's what we, we believe the number might be somewhere in the 600,000 range. We don't know what those yearly ecosystem benefits will be. Um, same thing as street trees, um, park trees do carbon storage, stormwater capture, and make our parks much more walkable. And this is the um, Morton Bay fig tree in Balboa Park, which it's the second largest uh, Morton Bay fig in the state. So it's pretty impressive. Um, it's pretty impressive on how large some of our trees can grow. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, private property and other, street tr uh, other trees in San Diego are also accounted for, although we don't manage those trees as um, the city of San Diego but possibly four million plus trees are found on private property. Uh, we know this through, <coughs> excuse me, our partnership with the U.S. Forest Service, who've set up random plots throughout the city um, to take measurements of uh, trees that are in people's backyards or in um, other private property locations, as well as um, public locations and parks as well. Same thing too um, with LIDAR, we've, we've gotten that estimate that there's about four million trees on private property. Already mentioned our street tree inventory. Um, actually this screen, well I guess this screenshot here says 232,000 trees, but I know that we've had a few more um, measured in the last couple of months. Um, we're collecting about 26 different attributes for every single tree. Um, including species, height, diameter, what the condition of the tree is. We're looking for diseases um, and even um, determining if uh, maintenance is needed on some of our street trees throughout the city. Now a little bit more about the urban forestry program, um, who we are. Uh, tree, we have tree maintenance teams in both parks and recreation and the transportation department, uh, which includes tree trimmers, certified arborists, um, and a lot of our work is done by contract too as well. This is our mission and definition of an urban forest. San Diego Urban Forestry Program plants, maintains, protects, and promotes trees, benefiting all of San Diego. And an urban forest is an entire ecosystem that includes trees on both public and private lands. And unlike a natural forest, an urban forest needs to be maintained by people. Our program, uh, the urban forestry program, is guided by a five-year plan uh, that was adopted by the city council in 2017. And the plan priorities, there's three plan priorities, which includes um, increasing our tree canopy cover, but also includes maximizing um, efficiencies in how we manage our urban forest and also working with more community groups and partners um, in regards to our um, forestry needs or tree needs. And then the third priority is to minimize the risk of trees. So we know trees do good, they provide ecosystem benefits but trees need to be maintained. They do occasionally lose limbs or uh, sometimes get diseases, things like that. Um, we 
it, I don't know if it's on one of my slides here actually, but we trim somewhere in the ballpark of 50,000 trees um, between both parks and recreation locations and street tree locations every single year, which promotes the health of our urban forest, but also again, addresses a lot of um, public safety concerns in the right of way and in parks. Uh, I already mentioned sandiego.gov slash trees. That's the website for the program. Uh, and, in, and in addition to maintaining our trees, we do a lot of tree planting. I believe we planted a, around, actually a little over 2,000 trees um, in both parks and uh, right-of-way locations, street tree locations. If anyone's interested in getting a new street tree adjacent to their home, they can go to um, the website here, sandiego.gov uh, slash blog slash free tree SD. One of the things we're also concerned about is tree protection and tree preservation. So it's great that we um, are planting hundreds of trees every year. Um, however, in order to maintain our uh, urban tree canopy cover, we, we want to keep the existing trees that we have already. Um, so it's important for us to um, maintain our trees through periodic trimming, through treatments, uh, and occasionally even remove trees to promote a healthy forest. Um, this photo on the, let's see here, the left, is a great example of um, some of the work that the city of San Diego does through the transportation department, uh, redesigning sidewalks around our existing large trees so that we don't have to remove those trees. Um, photo on the top right is an example of some tree damage, a tree grate uh, that's basically girdling the tree. Uh, so we're working in areas, especially downtown, where there's a lot of tree grates, trying to figure out um, how we can remove some of the grates or reset grates um, in order to um, promote healthier trees down there. Uh, not the clearest photo here, but photo on the left um, is a tree removal uh, of a canary island date palm. Right now we've um, got the South American palm weevil um, that's taken out well, approximately 200, uh, over 200 uh, Canary Island date palms on a yearly basis. Uh, luckily, we've been able to treat some of those trees um, to keep the weevil off of them, but um, it's, for the most part, we're losing a lot of those Canary Island date palms. Tree maintenance. Um, for any citizen or any resident, any business in the city of San Diego um, that um, see something on their street tree um, and wants to report it, there's a condition, there's a problem, um, or the we, we get requests often for branches being too low for clearance, they can go to san diego.gov and use the city's get it done application. Um, yeah, I mean, we're minimizing the risk of, um, which, of which larger trees can pose to the community, but basically through our trimming efforts, we're enhancing um, the benefits of those trees and those ecosystem benefits. We have a lot of partners as well. Um, our program uh, is not just Parks and Recreation and Transportation Department but it's really a, a multiple number of departments throughout the city of San Diego that help us manage uh, our urban forest. We have a community forest advisory board made up of uh, about 15 volunteers that help guide the program, provide advice to the um, city forester, which is me, on a monthly basis. We partner with um, the federal government, the US Forest Service, as well as the state Cal Fire has an urban forestry section. Um, they've helped uh, provide uh, grants for tree planting in the past, such as the trees that were planted in Nestor, and as well as um, 15 trees that were planted here at the public library, including the Arbor Day event last year. We also work with the County Pest Detection Program, UC Riverside, and we've got a lot of community collaboration 
from groups throughout the city, including Tree San Diego, Regional Urban Forestry Council, Urban Corps of San Diego County, Forever Balboa Park, the San Diego Parks Foundation, and recently have an agreement with um, SDG&E uh, to plant uh, 2,500 trees in the next 10 years throughout the city. And with that, I, I'll um, give the mic over to Mark from Parks and Rec. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate that. Um, all right. So um, I'm Mark Berninger. Ooh. I'm Mark Berninger uh, with the City of San Diego's Parks and Rec Department. Um, I'm our Natural Resources Manager. So while Brian manages our urban forest, I manage our, our, uh, our forest forest. <laughs> Uh, the forest uh, of all our open spaces and um, areas around the coast uh, and some things like that. So when we're talking about our climate equity plan and our climate uh, action plan, Park and Rec is taking the lead in some of these um, opportunities with mobility, resiliency, and healthy ecosystems as well. And so one of the things we're going to be doing um, with our different strategies for mobility and land use um, we're going to be including tr trees and cooling features at our parks, um, especially those in communities of concern, um, which have been historically kind of uh, un un um, unreached web by some of these uh, these planting efforts. I to say, um, we're also going to uh, implement the San Diego River Park Master Plan. Um, this is a plan that already exists within the city, um, but it includes a lot more. Um, collaborations with our partners around the San Diego River Park to create this a uh, walkable place around the San Diego River and create this really urban um, environment around one of our most important resources which is the San Diego River and its watershed around the, around the city. Um, with strategy five, our resilient infrastructure and healthy ecosystems that we're talking about today, we have, we're taking the lead in restoration, education, um, and um, and recreation around our urban canyons, uh, our some of our wetlands and our uplands, and a lot of this um, is stuff that we're already doing. Um, if you have been to any of our our open space parks, like Mission Trails or Los Penasquitos, uh, Otay River Valley down here, the Otay River Valley uh, Community Park, um, you see a lot of these these habitats um, down there, wetlands, uplands, and wetlands are really those areas kind of associated with riverine systems or maybe some vernal pools, things like that, and coastal wetlands, of course, as well. Um, and so our plan is really going to help preserve um, the our climate action plan is really going to help us preserve and preserve these lands, conserve them as well. So when we talk about preservation and conservation, these are two terms that are used a lot of times interchangeably. But co conservation is how we interact with our environment, and preservation is how we take the environment away from those un unsavory activities like illegal trail building or um, or things like that. So we want to preserve land and conserve. We want to work with it and work to preserve it and, and keep people and, and things away from um, impacting those special, those special places. Um, so our plans are, again, to preserve more land um, and learn a little bit more about sequestration. Right now, when we're looking at sequestering carbon in our ecosystems, a lot of the data is, is focused on coastal wetlands. And that data right now is, is showing us that coastal wetlands do a really, really good job of sequestering carbon. But we don't have the data to show about what our upland habitats are doing. So like our coastal sage scrub habitats or our grassland habitats or chaparral habitats, these are all habitats that have lush growing um, green uh, ecosystems, but we don't have the data that shows how much carbon is being sequestered by these and how much. So one of the things we're going to be working on really um, through this whole program and working with our partners on is trying to quantify that so we can put a number to it. So we can say, oh, so we know for every acre of, of coastal wetland we restore, we know how much carbon that's going to sequester. We don't know, again, those, uh, those upland habitats, but we're going to work really hard to get that and include that in some of our restoration plans and, and grants going forward in, in the future here. And again, we're talking about San Diego River um, and the 
restoration and sequestration of carbon within the San Diego River area. Um, you can see one of the, one of the great um, things we've done recently is with our partners in San Diego Canyonlands is create the City Heights, City Heights Canyons Loop Trail, um, which takes all our urban canyons and kind of creates a nice, beautiful walking area through those urban canyons. And these urban canyons are preserved not just for infrastructure like stormwater, wastewater, our water systems that go through these urban canyons, but we're preserving them for our endangered species we have in there. We have, criti we have critical habitat for some endangered species and birds and plants and animals that live in there. And we're also preserving that for the walkability of the community and the livability of those communities as well. So I talked a little bit about how we're gonna reach some of these strategies and, and I'll talk about this in the next thing. So. Um, so some of the ways we're gonna to incorporate trees and cooling features in our parks is we have a consultant's guide to park design and development. And in that park, and in that park design, we call it the, I think it's the white book, we call it. Um, we're gonna update some of these guides to say, here's what we should be doing when we're building new parks or new features in our parks. We should really focus on making them, making sure that they provide cooling for the area, maybe a, a water feature, some shade sails, something like that. So really kind of integrate that whole process into the park design process, even more so than we do now. Um, as I said, we're gonna implement our San Diego River Park Master Plan to increase mobility. And I do have some great news, we're already doing this. <laughs> so um, we're, we're fully engrossed in this and working together with partners. Um, you can see even with the, the development of the San Diego State's new Snapdragon Stadium down in the river, um, there's the inclusion of some parks there. So we're gonna build off that and build with our partners, the San Diego River Park Foundation, San Diego Audubon, Urban Corps of San Diego, all the San Diego Canyonlands, all these great organizations we work with day in and day out. We're gonna work with them closely to create jobs and volunteer opportunities throughout the river corridor. Um, this is the one that's kind of near and dear to my heart, um, protecting and, and conserving um, our urban canyons. You know, again, we've been doing this for a long time. The city has implemented a plan in 1997 called a Multiple Species Conservation Program. And what that does is it, it shows, it focuses on about 85 different plants and animals throughout the city that we wanna conserve as part of our resources and we wanna conserve them um, to make sure they have a place to live in perpetuity. Some of the things you can see here, this little flowers on the bottom corner, this is a plant called the Otay um, Mesa Mint. This lives nowhere else in the world but here in Otay Mesa and um, it's a highly endangered plant that lives, you know, like lives only here, but it also grows in vernal pools, which are another highly conserved area here in Otamisa. Um, again, some of our uh, a little charismatic bird over there, the burrowing owl, makes its home very close to here. Um, some places here in, in Otay Mesa, um, also they winter in Mission Bay Park, um, even Mission Trails Park. Um, these are again, very highly uh, threatened species. And you can kind of see some of the education we do here in the middle with our Battle Trail, which is a trail at Tecolote Nature Center, which has really good uh, public access, easy to walk, great information, and it shows the different stratus, statuses of restoration projects we're doing in Tecolote Canyon from areas that have been just um, inundated with invasive weeds to areas that have been removed, the invasive weeds have been removed, planted with native species. And that's what we're gonna keep doing again and again through those areas um, and to help kind of uh, build up those urban canyon areas. Um, one of the things, again, one of the things I, I work on a lot um, is our natural resource management plans. These are plans that direct how we manage our open space and how we manage the resources within those open spaces. Um, we have several of them that have already been developed and adopted, and we have several, many more, I should say, many more that we're working on here in the near future um, to kind of get those up and going, to give all of our resource managers, our my biologists, our park rangers, any of the other folks that are working in these areas to make sure that they have a roadmap to how to manage our areas here. Um, and you can see here, one of the ones we're working on currently is the Otay Valley Regional Park Master, or uh, 
natural resource management plan. Um, my staff and I are working diligently to get that on board um, and approved here in the next couple of years. Hopefully sooner than that, if we get a little bit more help uh, and funding from our budget, we'll see how that goes. Um, and I already talked a lot about the San Diego River. That's also a very important key feature in the San Diego, you know, as it, as it links all the way to our drinking water up in the El Capitan uh, Dam and the El Capitan Reservoir, all the way through Lakeside and Santee into Mission Trails, and then down through Mission Valley out to Mission Bay. So we're going to preserve the, the future of that river and really do um, try to identify some grants and partner with, our, with uh, again, those, all those amazing groups we partner with to try to restore that area to its, its former glory. And um, I really appreciate everybody's time today, and I really, um, I'm going to pass it over to Andrew with the Stormwater Department, and he's going to take the, the next round. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. My name is <coughs> Andrew Funk, and I'm a senior planner with the Stormwater Department for the City of San Diego. And <coughs> continuing on from all the great works at Park and Rec and our transportation urban, urban forestry program, I am here to talk about stormwater. So what is our department, what is our mission, and what do we do? Our mission is to keep our beaches, waterways, beaches and waterways clean, safe, and healthy for everyone. Specifically, our goals are to improve water quality, safeguard neighborhoods from flooding, modernize stormwater infrastructure, prioritize green infrastructure, revitalize our waterways, and capture stormwater for reuse. As we've mentioned and discussed throughout the presentation, stormwater is a consistent theme for a benefit of a lot of our work for climate action planning, and our department specifically does touch on both resiliency as well as mitigation for climate plan. Our presentation today is really specific to our climate action planning and our mitigation measures, so we'll kind of more tailor it towards that. What is stormwater? You've been hearing this word, might not be specifically familiar with it. When it rains, stormwater floods from roofs, sidewalks, and other urban surfaces on a city streets where it is conveyed untreated into local waterways and eventually the Pacific Ocean. I think that's a very good point to kind of help reiterate. That water is not being treated before it's being conveyed into streams and ultimately the Pacific Ocean. So what we do upstream to make sure that our system is clean before it does enter the system is very, very vital. What is our infrastructure itself? These pictures are a little bit small, so it might be kind of difficult to see, but the primary aspect that you see every day are storm drain inlets along the city roads. <clears throat> Specifically, our department has over a thousand miles of pipeline running underground where stormwater infrastructure is, stormwater is conveyed to streams in the ocean. And we also have over 46,000 storm drain inlets as well as outfalls. We additionally have around 70 miles of channels that do convey stormwater through more of concrete open channels. You can kind of see pictures of that. Another way our department does interface with the public is street sweeping. Unfortunately, I myself have gotten some of these street sweeping tickets, um, not remembering to move my car appropriately. The city itself does street sweep over 2,000 miles of roadways every year, and that does pick up a good significant amount of trash that we are preventing from entering our infrastructure, as well as being conveyed out to the Pacific Ocean. In regards to climate action planning, where do we roll? Where do we fit in? What is our role? Specifically, we are in the local water supply and increase in our local water supply action. Why is that important? Because imported water, as I will touch on shortly, does have a GHG, GHG component. So reducing our imported water supplies and increasing our local water supplies does tie it back directly to climate action mitigation. Here's kind of our four examples. The top three are specifically what the city is doing on our end. The fourth is what we really need help from the public because of the private resident aspects. The first is maximizing, and pl maximizing planning and implementation of green infrastructure with specific focus on stakeholder engagement in communities of concern such as this. Green infrastructure was already mentioned. It has multi-benefits from flooding, water quality, as well as water supply. Um, expanding opportunities to collect and use rainwater. As I mentioned, we can use reuse rainwater for local supplies, as well as to also augment our sewer system supplies, which connect to pure water, which is our public utilities department of potable reuse and recycling our water through our system. 
We also implementing our waterways restoration projects. Per the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, the majority of all of our waterways within the region are impaired. Um, so we are currently working on restoration projects to restore local waterways, wetlands, as well as other projects. And then this fourth component, this is where we really want to engage the public, and that's expanding awareness of the city's rainwater harvesting program, which also which also for specific rebates for rainwater harvesting, as well as glass, grass replacement programs. So with that, I think this is a great year to really illustrate the importance of stormwater. We've had a ton of rain. It rained a little bit this morning. We might get a little bit more rain throughout the year. Um, so just some important stats. Did you know the city imports roughly 80 to 5, 85 to 90 percent of our drinking water supplies? That's predominantly from the Colorado River as well as <clears throat> the Sierra Nevadas. So that is a huge issue for the city. Lawns are also estimated to use 44 gallons per square foot, which is a huge amount of water, and that is just your <clears throat> normal, typical tap turf or grass. But in the counterpoint, in a thousand square foot house and or roof can capture roughly 625 gallons of water for every one inch of rain that falls. And in San Diego, coastally, roughly 10 inches of rain fall within the city. Why is that important? If you have a thousand square foot house, as this example implies, you could capture over 6,000 gallons of rainwater that you could use on site for your property. Moving forward, as you can see on the graphs on the left, and Julie also touched on, the magnitude and frequency of our precipitation events moving forward will be fluctuating with climate change. So there's a huge opportunity to collect rainwater within the city, and we really want to <clears throat> push, and push and provide opportunities for residents to obtain and reap all of these multi-benefits. So what can you do to help incentivize normal citizens to collect rainwater harvesting? The city, in partnership with the Metropolitan Water District, as well as the County Water Authority, do provide several rebates to our residents to provide home upgrades where we can def directly provide funding. Those are specifically rain barrels, having a rain barrel as pictured in the green to capture and store rainwater. Rain gutters, which is just the gutter around your house. Not a lot of properties within San Diego have that. That is kind of a unique aspect and is essential for connecting to a rain barrel. Downspout re redirects, kind of tailoring into where does the gutter lead to the rain barrel itself, as well as landscape transformation program and SoCal Water Smart. As I mentioned before, turf and grass do require a lot of water, so transitioning and altering your landscape to more drought tolerant plants and native landscape definitely reaps benefits. With all of these programs combined, you can get over $1,000 back for implementing water conservation rebates at your property, and it's definitely helping this city obtain our overall climate action goals. If you're interested, you can access the city's website here, or just Google City of San Diego Water Conservation, or City of San Diego Think Blue, and it will take you to those sites. In addition to just our water conservation rebates, we do coordinate with other partners, Parks and Rec, as well as other local nonprofits, for cleanup specifically in our waterways, beaches, and coastal zones. This coming Saturday, we do have our Creek to Bay cleanup, our 21st annual one. Woohoo, super excited. Um, with, in partnership with I Love a Clean San Diego. So if you're looking to attend, we are going to have a bunch of decentralized cleanup sites. So in your neighborhood, Mission Bay, wherever you would like to join, please feel free to attend. And then if you have any questions, our department specifically does have its own website, Think Blue San Diego, where it is a great resource with just all information on what we do, as well as any questions that you might be able to attain or ask. We'll also be here to field any questions as needed. And with that, I will kick it back to Val.
Okay, so now I'm going to go briefly over steps that uh, regular San Diegans can take to uh, help us build climate resilience. So these are gonna be just a few examples of the opportunities that are available. Of course, volunteer and you know just self-motivated uh, opportunities change all the time. So it's worth your while to go looking online to see what else we've got available right now. Suggestions that we have are, you could join a volunteer day at Wild Willow Farms. That is located here in Otay Mesa. Um, and what they offer is they offer opportunities for people to learn how to actually do sustainable farming on their own. So they're right now running about two volunteer days a month. You get to go work on a farm for a day and see uh, see how to grow your own food. They welcome family participation. They don't ask for any experience whatsoever. You can just show up and they'll show you what to do. Um, Bayside Community, which is located, uh, the Bayside Community Center, which is located in Linda Vista, has a tiny gardens program. They are encouraging people to use uh, sustainable, locally grown produce. If you go to the community center, they can give you, if you are a low income family with children, you can get a grow bag to bring home. It has locally um, sourced seeds and produce that you can learn to grow on your own. Again, they will give you tips for that. They also offer programs that uh, teach people how to cook various kinds of locally grown produce. produce. So also ways to learn how to use that. Uh, I used to be in one of those CSA, CSA, the, the farm box programs, and uh, having recipes is a gigantic help because I don't normally cook. So knowing what to do with it, it when you get it, is a great help. Um, other things that might be important to you, if you are in a, if you're in an area of San Diego that undergoes these extreme heat events, and if you don't have a way to keep your own residence cool, no air conditioning, not great ventilation, the city does provide cool zones. Um, you can go onto our website to find out where those are. They are in um, specific community and recreation centers around the city, and in most libraries. I actually have a printout that shows those locations. They are available during open operating hours and they're available, I believe, when the temperature hits over 85 degrees. So keep that in mind for the upcoming summer. summer. I know it got really hot. If you need a place to cool down, literally, these are, these are places you can go. Other things that you can do today to build climate resilience. It's really important, actually, this is just important for life in general, to have an emergency supply kit for evacuation during wildfires, other disasters, earthquakes, you know, things like that. Really important to figure out what you need to take with you if you need to leave in a hurry. How can you, uh, how can you maintain what you need to have, medications, information, basic uh, insurance cards, all that stuff, if you needed to evacuate, knowing where you're gonna evacuate, knowing how you're gonna sync up with your family and friends after you leave your home. All of these things are important. You can find a ton of information online about um, kind of emergency go bags for things that you should keep in mind and keep that on hand, especially as the wildfire season approaches us. Um, it's always good to talk to people around you about climate change. Um, I know that this is maybe one of those like taboo subjects that we don't talk about in polite in polite society, but it's very helpful to sort of normalize these conversations just so that people understand that as, uh, as you've been hearing today, some effects of climate change are unavoidable. We're sort of heading for those no matter what. And knowing what you're going to do once those events start to hit is really important. And knowing what you can do to help mitigate that change is also really important because we're not just gonna sit here and say, well, there's nothing we can do about it. There are plenty of things we can do and it's good to be prepared and good to talk to other people about it. Um, the Free Tree SD program that Brian talked about, um, very awesome. If you have, uh, if you have property available next to your home in the right of way, this is where you can have the city come plant a tree for you for free. They will come up with a list of the best tree options that you have for your particular area, so the ones that are most likely to thrive. The only thing that you have to do is agree to have the tree and agree to keep it alive for, I think, two years. So you've got three years. you got to water it for three years. So you need to have water available. But um, if you signed up for the rain barrel program, you could like also water your tree so it all goes together. This would be awesome. Um, this QR code is for the free tree SD program. Awesome opportunity. Give it a try. We have more information about uh, volunteer opportunities for parks and rec recreation. Um, we have both 
volunteer internship and work readiness programs and actual jobs. Um, if you know anybody who's looking to work for the city, volunteer for the city, check out this information. And uh, lastly, I'm gonna plug Arbor Day coming up next weekend. Uh, because it's Earth Day, this is why there are so many things all happening at the same time. But it's an exciting opportunity. If you want to go do some volunteer work, you can pick from the many opportunities that we've talked about today. This particular one is, um, as mentioned before, in Mission Bay, they aim to plant, oh, I think I, 80, I forgot, how many, 60? 60 trees. Um, if you are interested in planting a tree, you need to go to uh, the city web website. Just search Arbor Day 2023 San Diego. You'll get to the website. You need to sign up if you want to plant a tree. If you just want to show up and participate in the other activities, you can do that. Um, you can talk to Brian after this, and he can point out the trees that got planted here last year for Arbor Day. They're coming up on their one-year anniversary. That's super exciting. So um, again, yet another volunteer opportunity for those who want to get involved. And that is it for me. I will hand it back to Val. All right, so that concludes the presentation part of the program. We just want to have, I know we have a small crowd today, but and we don't want to put you on the spot, but we do want to hear from you if you'd like to share some perspective and opinion. Um, maybe some ways of how you're already uh, involved in climate action. And if you haven't been involved in climate action, that's okay. Um, one of the things that I do as an example is, um, as a new San Diegan, I am very mindful of my electric bill now. Um, and so I do things like do my laundry and uh, cook uh, in the evenings off of uh, outside of peak hours, because I know that that will help my energy bill to stay lower. Um, would you all like to share any ways that you are contributing to climate action in your own personal experience? And if not, it's okay. No? Okay. Um, and then the last one uh, question that we have for you all, and this is to take back with us as feedback so that we can continue to prioritize uh, the needs of our community. The, this bullet list here is a list of CAP actions, um, climate action plan actions, uh, sort of an overview more generally of the things that are traditionally covered uh, within this umbrella. So things like sidewalk and street lighting improvements, public transit enhancements, um, upgrades that comply with the American Disabilities uh, uh, ADA standards, <laughs> expansion of tree canopy, resiliency upgrades for community centers, um, walking, rolling, biking, accessibility and safety, um, things like stormwater improvements and um, uh, things with our, to do with our waterways, canyons and streams restoration, uh, and then park acreage, construct, constructing parks, acquisition and preservation of open space. Um, so just a question, you know, a couple questions for the audience, which out of these actions might be some of your highest priorities in your community? Are there any here that stand out for you, like top three or one that's the most priority for you? Tree canopy, tree canopy. all right, I hear tree canopy. Let's get a dot on the tree canopy one. Um, Sidewalks, okay. Do you want to share a little bit more on the sidewalks? Is it safety? Is it improvement? Like, what is it? Safety? There's a lot of puddling, and I know my sister is, my sister is, uh, used to walk a lot, and she, uh, her vision was impaired, and she trips quite a few times mm. on the sidewalk because it's always lifted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, Street lighting, okay. Another, is that like a safety component or? Okay, okay, thank you so much. See a hand back there. All right, so just for the audience online, sidewalks, street lighting, and walkability, right? Okay. Um, what actions on this list um, do you think you might need more information on? Are there any here that you're kind of scratching your head and wondering what that might be? Pretty clear? 
Okay, okay. Um, and then lastly, because we want to be inclusive, right? This isn't a, an all-inclusive list. Are there any actions that we might have missed from this list? Anything that we didn't discuss today that you think might fall under the resilience umbrella? All right, okay. Um, well then with that, I will go ahead and just thank you very much for joining our resilience workshop and appreciate your time. Thank you to all of our partner agencies as well. And I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. Thank you.